Our scripture reading today comes from Romans 13, 8 through 10. You should owe nothing to anyone except that you will always owe love to each other. The person who loves others has done all that the laws command. The law says you must not commit adultery. You must not murder anyone. You must not steal. You must not want what belongs to someone else. All the commands and all other commands are really only one rule. Love your neighbor the same as you love yourself. Love doesn't hurt others. So loving is the same as obeying all the law. At this time, I would ask Richard to join us and bring us our message this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here uh, involved in this service this morning because it is such a special service and one that uh, many of us have been excited about and looking forward to for uh, a long time. And, uh, and it's great that today is here. Uh, this is like Christmas morning sometimes, the, the anticipation. Uh, and so today has finally arrived and uh, we're excited about that. Um, I love the uh, the scripture that Earl just shared. Uh, I think it's a it's a beautiful scripture, and 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 quite honestly, I wasn't as familiar with this scripture as I'm familiar with the scripture from which it comes. Uh, and so, I want to share that a little bit uh, in my in my message this morning. Uh, it talks about um, if you have loved one another, you have fulfilled the law, um, and all of the other commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. All of these other things are summed up in this idea that love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, we've heard this before, haven't we? Um, this is, but I like the context in which uh, this is clarified some more, which is love does no wrong to a neighbor. No one gets hurt uh, by love. And this harkens back to, uh, what we know from the book of Mark. Uh, and it was a story of one of the teachers of the law came and heard debating and noticing that Jesus uh, was there. He asked him of all the commandments, which is the most important. Do you all remember this scripture? Are you familiar with this? Uh, the most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Um, when, when my girls were young, one of the things that we struggled with was, especially before they could really understand if-then-else statements, <laughs> If you do this, then this will happen. And when they couldn't understand that as well, I was like, how do we explain a thousand different things that they need to kind of navigate the correct way in a way that they can understand it? And I came up with this idea. Similar to the book of Mark, I said, there are two rules. And if you obey these two rules, you're fine. And when you disobey, Usually anything that you do that gets you in trouble can trace, be traced back to one of these two rules were violated. The two rules were this, do what we say to do the first time we say to do it. And whenever something would go awry, we'd go back and say, now let's revisit the two rules. And they go, I, I messed up on the second one. Yep, 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 that was it. <laughs> or yep, I didn't do the first one, right? Right. That was it. But in order to say, you know, but I'd never been to a bank. I didn't know how to act in a bank. But what were the first two rules? Those applied universally, regardless of the situation around it. And so that helped us navigate through a lot of those early years of them understanding what was expected of them and how best to navigate through situations that might even be unfamiliar. We will guide you. We will tell you what you need to do. And as long as you do what we tell you to do the first time you tell us, we tell you to do it. 
things will work out. Okay. And that helped. That helped for a number of years. Now I'm going to fast forward. Then it came time for them to start driving. And we said, you know, uh, how do you want to do this? Do you want to go to a school to learn how to drive? Uh, do you want to have uh, either your mom or myself teach you to drive? And they said, Dad, we want you to teach us to drive. Okay. And have you ever read through the rules of the road? There's a thousand rules, right? It gets very, very complicated, and it's very hard to understand. And when you come to an intersection where there are there's two turn lanes and four side lanes, and uh, and there's a media, how, how do you do all of this, right? And I said, girls, I'm going to break it down to two rules. Here are the rules of learning how to drive. And as long as you follow these two rules, you'll be fine. Ready? Avoid the idiots. It's about defensive driving. <laughs> Even if they're doing something wrong, you don't just say, yeah, but I'm in the right, so I'm going to go ahead and go, and they'll hit me, but I was in the right. No, avoid the idiots. That's rule number one. Rule number two, very similar. Don't be an idiot. Follow these two rules, you'll probably be okay on the road. And the, the the worst part about this was when they were young and we had the two rules, they'd follow the two rules and there wasn't much counter. When they were older and they understood things a lot more, then when I was driving and something would happen, they would say, Dad, you were the idiot in that one, weren't you? Yes, I was. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> But life can usually be kind of boiled down to some, what are the key things? And when you look at the, the laws at the time, and you look at all the things that, that uh, people were asked to learn and to understand and to follow and to not violate, Jesus said, I'm going to give you two rules here. And if you follow these two rules, you'll be okay. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. It's about love. Love does not harm another person. I've shared uh, here in this sanctuary before, uh, it's a video of a man who was in prison for many, many years. And uh, and he described that um, he did not know what love was. He did not understand love. And this is how he interpreted love with his wife was, the more pain that she can take from me is an indication of how much she loves me. That was his understanding, was love was in correlation to pain. And when he ended up in prison and the mother of his victim came and visited him in prison and shared with him a love that he had never known before until he understood it, then he realized that love doesn't hurt. Love doesn't cause that harm, doesn't cause that pain. And that's what our scripture is saying this morning. And I think it's a, I love that Romans provided some more context behind uh, the two most important commandments as Jesus shared them. I want to share with you something uh, that happened, uh, an experience I uh, had the, the great fortune to be involved in, and it happened right outside there in the foyer. And it has to do with these. We have two different sets of offertory plates in our congregation. We have the silver ones, the real shiny ones, and then we have these wooden offertory plates. Does anybody know why we have two sets of offertory plates in our congregation? I mean, one was, the, the first set was sufficient. It worked, the silver plates worked. They collected the offering. They didn't have holes in them. We didn't lose anything as a result of using those plates. Why did we get two sets of plates for offertory in our congregation? I want to share with you the story behind it because it wrote on me uh, in a very profound way. And uh, it's one that, like I said, I'm, I'm always grateful that I had that experience. Before COVID, uh, we were uh, trying some different things in terms of use of our new facility. Uh, 
as we had renovated the the other half of the facility and had a new foyer and had the the big fellowship hall in the back uh we were trying some different things and one of the things that we tried was arts and crafts shows uh, a community arts and crafts gathering as well as a community yard sale and uh, interestingly enough, the community yard sale had much more attendance in terms of people coming to shop than what the arts and craft uh, did. Uh, and so when we had a community yard sale, there'd be a lot of people flowing through the church, going to the different booths uh, of people who had apartment com who lived in the apartment complexes around here and therefore were uh, selling their items in our community yard sale. Uh, when we had the arts and craft, we found that it just didn't have as much attendance. We had plenty of crafters that came in. All the booths were always full but we didn't have as many people flowing through. And that was the case this one day. And it was unfortunate, we didn't like that. You know, here's people who were bringing their items to sell and they're really beautiful, wonderful items, but we just didn't have that much traffic coming through and buying. And so uh, I would sit down with people and talk with them uh, that were selling items. And I, there was a man and his wife in the foyer and they had a booth and he was selling woodworking items that he had created. And so I was chatting with him and I found out that he was, uh, he was a retired pastor. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, where were you a pastor at? I was in the deep South. I can't remember if it was Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, somewhere in that area, but he was a pastor in the deep South. He goes, yep, I was a pastor in the deep South during the civil rights era. He said, oh, that would be a challenging time to be a pastor. And so I said, I'm going to grab a chair because <laughs> I'd like to chat with you some more. Uh, I'd like to hear what those experiences were like. And he explained that it was it was a challenging time, uh, that there were so many different opinions. And these opinions were so rooted, uh, not in love, but were re re rooted in antagonism and uh, bitter disagreement uh, and hatred. And I said, I asked him, as a pastor of a congregation made up of individuals who might have different thoughts and opinions and outlooks on things that are happening real time and shifting regularly and quickly, how did you navigate through that with your congregation? And this is what he told me. He said, Richard, you have to find a place of love in each person. You have to sit with them and you have to talk with them until you find something, regardless of what their views might be, you find something that you love about that person and you go from there and you come back to that spot and you go from there but it has to do with first love. And I was so thankful to have that moment uh, with him. Um, and unfortunately, no one was buying any of his woodwork that he had there to sell that day. And so I, sell, I saw one of these on his table. And I said, can you make me another one like that? Because we could really use another set of offertory plates in our congregation. And so anytime you see offertory, our offertory being picked up using these plates, I want you to think back to its basis is in love. That's the message behind these plates is that whatever we do, we first start with finding a position of love finding a reason to love and going from there. That's what we are being taught today in our scripture lesson. Love doesn't hurt in the midst of possibly painful times. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And that is our commandment to follow. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in that first commandment that Jesus gave in Mark, where he says, love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Today, we come to this service 
celebrate together with Terry as he makes the decision to enter into the waters of baptism and to be confirmed with the Holy Spirit. Any time that you can be involved in a service in which a sacrament is taking place, that's a good day. And today is an awesome day. Terry has decided to make a commitment today in front of us and to share that commitment with us. And we celebrate that with him. It says, love your God with all your heart. Just recently, I had the honor and the privilege uh, to be involved in the wedding of Terry and Lynn. And it was a beautiful, beautiful setting. It was a beautiful evening and there were beautiful people gathered and it was just a wonderful, wonderful night. But I want to talk about what led up to that. And leading up to that, Terry and Lynn and I had uh, many times in which we were able to talk about them, talk about their relationship, talk about the wedding itself, just talk. And uh, and we would spend uh, the 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 agenda or the schedule was about an hour. Um, it didn't always stop at an hour. Uh, sometimes we'd go longer than that. But it was a privilege for me uh, to get to know Terry on a deeper level through that process. And what I can share with the congregation this morning is that Terry has a beautiful heart. And it's a heart full of love and generosity and giving and empathy. And so when we read this scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, Terry does. And today he's sharing that with us. And so I am very excited about what we have before us this morning. I am very excited about the decision that Terry made uh, a while ago. Uh, I'm excited for the preparation that he has put into this day. I'm excited for this congregation and all who come in contact with Terry from this day forward as a result of today. And most of all, I'm excited, Terry, for you. I think this is a, a wonderful thing that you are doing, and um, and I thank you for doing it here at Shenandoah, and I thank you for doing it here with us. As we begin to prepare for the baptism, Earl and Terry will enter into the waters here. And while they are doing that, we will be singing a hymn. We'll be singing appropriately a hymn titled Jesus Loves Me. Uh, hymn number 251 will remain seated for the singing of this hymn. Um, and uh, after the hymn is completed, then we will witness the baptism of Terry Knight.
Terry. I'm here today to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's give him a thought.